they have reduced it by 99% their carbon footprint. Say that again. 99% less carbon emission for their HPC data center. Just, Just say that moment. one more time. <laughs> 99%. That is huge. Definitely yeah, right. it, it's definitely true that HPC, it's a, it's a tool, right, right, that can help us to be more, more sustainable. But to be honest, it's very compute intense, as the name suggests, mm -hmm. and all this computing power uh, also generate a lot of carbon emissions. We, we are seeing customers that are now trying to address HPC also from this other angle. We need to have HPC resources but we want to have sustainable HPC. We want to reduce our carbon footprint because it's now part of the overall strategy. This is a tough area for customers to dig into because I mean, yeah. to start with, like building a supercomputer anyway is really hard. It's a bloody complicated optimization problem with so many different variables of you know, moving parts, you know, and that, that gets all the way down to which processor bin you choose as to what the power performance and the price performance efficiency of it and how your code's going to run on it. Then, then customers got to go and build data centers. They have to skill up in some really pretty extravagant technologies now because the heat coming out of GPUs is not the kind of stuff that you can blow away with an air conditioner. And then go one step further, actually sustainably powering the whole thing. Yes. These are, these are all tough gigs. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very tough. HPC has always been tough. And now having also the uh, sustainability into the picture makes things even harder. So GPUs, yes, on one end, they are very, very efficient, right? From a workload point of view, for many workloads, they can provide a very good acceleration, but they also consume a lot of energy. So what is the right balance between, you know, between the two? Now, it's, it's really another component that you have to take into consideration. Well, the good news are that in the cloud, you know, AWS as part of Amazon is, is committed to uh, become uh, carbon neutral by um, uh, 2040, right? So it's uh, That's a years. good decade ahead of the, the exactly. worldwide mandate, right? Exactly, exactly. And AWS as part of Amazon, of course, is uh, also committed to achieve the same goal. So what we are doing as AWS, we want to uh, to basically be carbon free. Uh, our data center will be carbon free by 2025. So it's basically next year, yes. Right. So just by moving to, to the cloud, just by moving to AWS, this will help you a lot. 2025 is not far away. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, you know, we are already, I think, the, the largest buyer of re renewable energy on the planet. And this is where things are also interesting because we have customers that design, for example, the wind turbines on AWS. And then we, we buy these wind turbines to generate the energy that powers the cloud that we use for the HPC and so sounds on. Sounds like a that sounds like a it's flywheel a going on there. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful flywheel. Yes. It really is. Yes. There's there's another in interesting thing there. So there's an interesting data point that I just picked up recently, which is that, um, you know, our data center infrastructure that we build is is around five times more power efficient um, for the same compute workloads than the average European enterprise yes, data center, yeah. which is, which is, you know, it's kind of awful. We're, we're here this week at, at ISC 24 in Hamburg. So there's a European context to all of this, but you know, we're three and a half times more power efficient than yeah. the average American corporate data center. I mean, these are, these are, these are big multiples. It's not, yeah, yeah, it's it, not that we're 30% more efficient, no, yes. three and a half to five times more efficient. Yeah. It's all about the, you know, the scale, right? When you build um, such a big scale, this will help you to have uh, also the economy of scale, right? And, and so have a bigger impact than the, the average data center. So that's right. what I mean, the, the kinds of technologies that customers would find really expensive to deploy themselves at a small scale. What you're saying is that at a much larger scale, we can deploy those much exactly. more economically efficiently. Exactly. And we have very interesting use case. For example, last year, Vicky Hughes, this is a public reference. I think we'll add the link somewhere. In yeah, the, yeah, in we in definitely the video. will. Uh, they have reduced it by 99% their carbon footprint for their HPC center. Say that again. 99% less carbon emission for their HPC data center. Just, Just say that moment. one more time. <laughs> 99%. That is huge. It's, it's basically, yes, from, from a lot to, 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 to practically nothing. Yes. They've almost eliminated their carbon footprint exactly. as a result. Wow. Exactly. That's a trailblazing number to achieve, 99% yes. reduction in their carbon footprint. Yes. So if customers want to go down these paths and, and you know, get the same result, what can they do? So um, I think I would start with the region selection. Usually when you are running on-prem, you, you cannot select where you run your HPC, right? You have your data center, you're going to deploy your computing nodes in that data center. When you move to the cloud, you can select the region that you want. 
and this has a huge impact. Uh, on one end, you can stay uh, on, a, on an area, on a region, where uh, energy is generated by renewable energies, right? Exactly. Well, what about on the what about on the instant selection side? Because there's clearly there's some things we're doing there. Absolutely, absolutely. So the, the next step is really the instant selection. So uh, first and foremost, there are architecture like ARM architecture is, is is known for being more power efficient. So by moving to graviton, for example, customers are reducing their carbon footprint. Also, Tranium, Inferentia, this can help you to reduce your carbon footprint. I would say that my recommendation is measure. Right? You want to be sure that you start your computing nodes when they're needed, so when there is a job that needs to be run. You are using the instances that provide the best performance or the best price performance, and then when the job is done, you shut down the nodes. Right? So just being yeah. rational and turning stuff off <clears throat> when you're not using it. Yeah, exactly. And, and spinning things up when you are in the right numbers, getting your workloads done quickly, moving on. That, that elasticity is actually just going to matter. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And the good news are that we have a lot of tools like AWS Parallel Cluster, AWS Batch. We have orchestrators, let's say, and job schedulers that can help you to achieve this goal, right? And we also have a carbon dashboard, right? So we have a we have a carbon dashboard yes. in the AWS console where you can actually yes. see what the what your fleet is currently consuming. Exactly. Exactly. That that helps you. That's that's going to be an ultimate guide to being able to calibrate these. Yeah, things, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. From an HPC, let's say, point of view, what I what I recommend is really to keep measuring your, your performance, keep measuring the utilization of your cluster. You want to have your cluster fully utilized, right? So this is, I think the key word here is efficiency. You want to be efficient with your cluster. So you want to be sure that um, your computing nodes are always running, ideally they should always running with their CPU at 100%, so at full utilization or not, not running, running at, all. at all. You mentioned before that uh, in a traditional HPC procurement phase, there is an initial phase where you experiment a different configuration and then you decide which one you want to buy, you buy, it, and then let's say nine months, you have your supercomputer, right? Uh, things are different in the cloud. So, I mean, the decision you have made today, maybe in a couple of months would be updated because we have new instances, we have new hardware, and these are more efficient, both from a performance point of view, from a price performance point of view, from a sustainability point of view. So you really have to you know, continue to experiment and build your architecture in, in a way that is easier for you from, to switch from one instance type to the other one, right? So that you immediately capture the benefit. Doesn't mean that customers have to keep continuously working and always evaluating. It means that there's no one-way doors. None of these exactly. decisions are irreversible. They can always come back and reevaluate it if they think there's a, there's a thing yeah. worth doing. And yes. of course, this gets me on my other hobby horse about infrastructure as code. Yes. You know, encouraging customers to build their infrastructure using infrastructure as code techniques so that when they, when they do want to deploy a whole workload into a different compute environment, they can do kind of with a click or two of a mouse exactly without having to overhaul massive engineering um, steps right? and, and this is another point this is another recommendation i really give to customers that want to be more uh, carbon efficient with their hpc so it's choose, choose the right region select the right instance type orchestrate your workload and deploy your solution in a infrastructure that's code way so that it's easier for you to experiment with new stuff when you want to data yeah so the number one recommendation is be careful with the data you have on-prem, right? So there are some cases where you really need to have a kind of a hybrid setup, mixing together the resources you have locally and mm -hmm. the resources you have in the cloud, for example, if, you, if your data are generated in a, in a lab, right? But you need to be sure that uh, you are not replicating data across in two different environments. Uh, be sure to um, use techniques. Uh, we, we do have mechanisms such as file cache or that will help you to uh, have a, a seamless integration between your, the data you have on-prem and, and, and the cloud. And as much as possible, try to keep your data in the cloud, your, you know, the vast majority of the data in the cloud, because in the cloud, we also have tools that will help you with, with, you know, with the tiering, automatically compressing the data. And uh, as we said before, we are very efficient in the way we store data and in the way we consume the, consume energy to store this data. So Amazon S3 is the most yeah. ruthlessly efficient storage yes. environment I've ever seen in my life, in my yeah. entire career. It is ruthlessly efficient about power use and, and all those other things. And all those things lead to costs, right? So, so I mean, there's a, there's a reason why we keep those things super efficient. Keeping data in somewhere like a, a low tier and only bringing it up to a hot tier like, say, Lustre, yes. when you need to, is a way, way better 
way to spend your investment and yeah. to keep your carbon footprint low compared to say running everything in a lustre file system exactly. which you might be inclined to do i guess in, a, in an on-prem environment it's easier to have one file system in instead of three yeah but, but in cloud but, it's easy to have three or five exactly exactly so first and foremost shared file system are better than local disk right uh, try to avoid local disk if you if you if you really need one because you want a super fast scratch area try to use instances that comes with a local nvme disk right because these are fast number one and two are ephemeral uh, if you are using ebs be sure to delete them when they are no longer in use shared file systems are great because you you put the data here and are shared across all the computing nodes so they are very efficient and yes i totally agree that is a very good recommendation to use different file system for different scopes and uh, um, uh, manage your tiering having uh, s3 in the loop right i see a lot of customers using fsx for lastre for example as a kind of a cache for their uh, posix interface for their data but the data are really living in s3 with s3 tiering and so on so again power efficient performance efficient and also cost efficient now that the data is sitting in the cloud if i want to do visualization on that data yes how do i do that yeah, this is a common problem, for example, automotive and, and, and manufacturing, right? They need to run the pre-processing, the post-processing. So um, what we do not recommend is, again, to copy data back because these are copies, are, is a replica, it's a waste of disk space. So instead of, you know, running the HPC and then copy the results and analyze the results, do all the pre and post in the cloud. And we have tools, nice DCV, for example, that can help you uh, to visualize, to, to run a virtual desktop in the cloud. So your graphical application will live into the cloud and you will be able to uh, operate with your data without actually moving it. And with solutions such as Research Engineering Studio, even orchestrating this virtual desktop is, is very easy. Wow. Yeah, let's recap. Number one, select your region. And again, you don't have to choose one. You can have multiple regions, right? Stay closer to where your end users are. Choose the right instance type. Be sure that you are orchestrating your workload so that you are using your computing node only when needed. Use a variety of them. Different type of application will benefit from different type of hardware. So why not? Experiment with Graviton, with Trainium, with Inferentia. This will help you a lot. Be careful with your data. Try to keep all the data in the cloud. Use S3 as much as you can. Use uh, file cache or FSx for Lastre for the performance and the local NVMe disk if you really need a local fast scratch disk. And then finally, add the remote visualization into it so you can visualize your data without the need to copy them back and everything will, will live in the cloud. If you enjoyed this tech short, please give us a like and consider subscribing to the channel. If there's a topic you want us to focus on, reach out to us at askhpc at amazon.com. We want to make it easier for scientists and engineers to solve the world's hardest problems. We think the cloud can help by giving them access to powerful tools of any shape and size whenever they need them. And that's where you come in. Let us know what you need. We'll see you next time.